we started to speak on is the regulation of the tax provision. Um, and I'm really pleased to see that so many, so many practitioners sitting in the room because I think the impact of uh, and responsibilities going forward is going to be on a, on a different level than we were, when we were used to in the past. I'm not allowed to walk around. Um, I, may, I may look very uncomfortable here behind the podium, feeling like a reverend. I, I, I rather prefer walking around. Um, but due to the recording for the, for the Stream A delegates, um, they asked me to stand still uh, so that the camera can record the session. Um, you all received uh, the legislation, uh, legis legis legislation handbook, which is very important. I'm going to refer to that in a moment um, while I present. And then you all received the Tax Talk magazine as well. Now, this edition of Tax Talk uh, focused on the regulation, um, discussing the pertinent issues that I may highlight today and other issues, uh, not issues, but considerations that you as practitioners. Uh, uh, registered tax practitioners needs to be aware of going forward. Um, so really, um, if you're here today, this is a, a must read. The whole edition feature the regulation of practitioners. Um, just some uh, on the program, I will be speaking uh, until plus minus 14.15. Um, I don't necessarily keep to the time, uh, so please stop me if I need. I'm the chair of this afternoon session, so I may just uh, over, overrule myself. Um, then at 14.15, Kerry Watkin is going to present. I'll introduce her um, in detail a little bit later. And then after her presentation, uh, her presentation would focus on the Constitution and the TAA, Know Your Rights. Uh, then at, f at 3 o'clock, we're going to have often refreshments uh, and tea and networking. And then we're coming back at um, half past 3 for the final stretch. Um, on payroll compliance under the TAA by Yolandi Esterheisen. And I'll also introduce her um, a little bit later in detail. Um, I'm going to follow a different approach because this is a breakaway stream. Um, I would really like to understand your objectives. So I, I wrote down a few objectives that I set for myself for this afternoon session. But I would really like... To, to hear from your perspective um, what this whole regulation has come uh, to, to almost like to an end but also to a start because the recognized controlling bodies were rec uh, in terms of the TAA which I will also explain to you in a moment um, was recognized earlier this week um, on the eve of the conference or the afternoon of the con before the conference started um, and obviously now the focus really starts because now it becomes a reality um, and now we really have to reflect as to what this will really mean to us. Why? Because this is now a regulated profession. If you are this board or a tax practitioner or this board from practicing um, by a controlling body, a recognized controlling body, um, he or she may no longer practice, at least for five years. Um, so it's, it's really, I think, I don't, I, I don't think that practitioners really understand the impact of this um, and the responsibilities uh, that they will have in terms of complying uh, or, or to act diligently and to comply with professional standards. So um, hopefully we will see more and more uh, discussions around this topic evolving over the next few months as we teeth ourselves and uh, ourselves into this process um, as a whole industry, um, both accountants and attorneys um, and registered auditors who are all practicing or may practice as, as registered tax practitioners. So looking at my slide, I'm quickly going to give you a, a build-up to the regulation to explain to you where this all started. Um, it's almost like the e-tolling system. Um, we all thought e-tolling were announced in the, in the last year because that's when it received media attention. But it started long ago. And uh, to really understand the objectives and the policy behind uh, legislation is extremely important for us to be able to to embrace and accept um, the process. So I will I will quickly give you a build up to that, and then I'm going to highlight to you the current regulatory regime um, as I would st currently stand in the Act, and hopefully you all brought your 
your income tax legislation uh, co uh, complementary copy with you because I will um, refer to that directly through the Act, uh, within the Act. Um, and then touch on the policy behind the regulatory regime uh, throughout. So um, to, be, to explain to you what is the objectives of this, and it's something that, that, that we as um, practitioners uh, forget, and that is we need to understand the intention behind the legislature, um, the spirit of the legislation, the, the policy behind it. And over the last few years, those of you who take the time to read the explanatory memorandums published by uh, Treasury when they annually release the uh, Taxation Laws Amendment Bills, and those of you who have read the Tax Administration Act uh, explanatory memorandum of objects of the, of the TAA, um, that is primarily aimed at getting across the policy behind uh, the legislation, the spirit behind it. Um, so that when we interpret and read the legislation, that we don't massage the legislation to suit our own view, uh, because there are always communication expectation gaps, and Treasury and SARS are trying to eliminate um, that by consultation processes before legislation are promulgated, as well as, um, as publishing the explained memorandum, and therefore making sure that there are no hiccups um, and expectation gaps in interpreting the legislation. So I'll uh, refer to that in a moment as well. And then the future options, which is merely a fully regulated regime, which I'll also allude to in a moment. Um, any other objectives on your side? Or will we develop that as we go along? May I also suggest, please, um, unlike in the other sessions, this is a smaller group, what we can do, you can stop me um, and... and um, ask questions so that we can so that we can get a discussion going because as I said this is brand new legislation it's, it's quite unique it's uh, enhanced I refer to it as an enhanced regulation approach um, in a global context so again um, the, the thumbs up for SARS for being open-minded to co-regulate the profession with the recognized controlling bodies so just the build-up, how did it all start? Um, in the budget review, in the budget speech in 2002, uh, the then uh, Finance Minister Trevor Manuel stressed that he will task SARS to investigate the regulation of the profession. At that stage, um, it was highlighted that uh, certain complaints uh, has been received over a number of years by SARS uh, against the tax practitioner community for either acting unprofessionally, acting with, without the due level of competence, etc., etc. So those few bad apples in the system. So it was announced that SARS would, that SARS would be tossed in, in, in looking into a, a potential regulation of the profession. And then later that year, SARS issued a discussion paper um, stating that um, what has been confirmed or stated by the minister and elaborating a little bit on that and that is the fact that practitioners, there are a lot of practitioners in the system who make mistakes, uh, who assist the public and ultimately the taxpayer taking the brunt for either a late submission of return or um, errors and mistakes being made or even to the further end of the spectrum aggressive tax planning and impermissible tax uh, planning and avoidance schemes. So then we saw uh, in 2004 an amendment to the Income Tax Act about an introduction of Section 67A, if I'm not mistaken, if I still remember that. Uh, then that required all practitioners or tax practitioners, that says undefined, uh, who are in terms of Section 67A performing tax services for a fee to register with SARS. Now it started off with basically tax return preparers um, submitting tax returns to register with SARS. Um, and then in 2007, uh, the, f the first, uh, between 2004 and 2007, obviously uh, tax practitioners were required to register by the 2005, I think it was June. Um, and that created almost like a definition, a, a defining of the tax profession, almost like setting, knowing who are the guys out there. Um, and then the statistics uh, transpired and then we saw that 
more or less half of tax practitioners in South Africa do not belong to a professional body. And that um, almost was like proof for the minister's concern that taxpayers may not get advice consistent with legislation. Um, because taxation in our law, uh, those, of, those of the accountants who are in the room may uh, regularly disagree with me um, that taxation is accounting, it's not accounting, it's law. You interpret the law and you do calculations, you submit your returns based on the law. And um, if you're not appropriately qualified, we all know that even interpreting l the law and legislation from by highly qualified judges um, and practitioners, there are always disagreements um, in, terms of, in terms of what it means. Um, so if you are not qualified or inexperienced, how worse is the, the chances and uh, higher the chances of you, um, the public, receiving advice that's not consistent with the legislation. So that all transpired and then there was another discussion paper which I didn't uh, list in the build-up uh, uh, a report back basically by SARS stating these statistics, how many practitioners are in the system, um, who, what the qualifications are, etc, etc. And then we saw, then it was the, the whole regulation process was pushed forward to the fore uh, and we saw the draft regulation of tax practitioner bill. Now the initial bill uh, envisaged the establishment of a fully fledged regulator of tax uh, practitioners. Uh, the Independent Regulatory Board for Tax Practitioners. Uh, at that stage, the idea by SARS and Treasury was to establish a similar body than IRBA for the profession, which would even include clauses similar to the Auditing Professions Act by reporting irregularities, which was a concern to the entire industry. Um, the industry felt that um, are we now becoming uh, a, a watchdogs and agents for SARS? Okay? It, they felt that the whole intention we had evolved from 2002 to protect the public are now shifting to protecting uh, or to be uh, agents for SARS in the industry. But because there's public interest, one could understand and appreciate that there may be reporting requirements. Um, we've got uh, FICA legislation, we've got the Auditing Professions Act, various pieces of legislation requiring um, professionals to report um, uh, under declaration of fraud or um, misrepresentation of, of accounts and information. So, but still that was a contentious issue and then later, and Vernie, if I'm right, I couldn't find it, but it was 2009, if I, my mind serves me correctly, we saw a second draft regulation of tax practitioner bill. We saw, we saw that, that those requirements relaxed, but still a fully fledged regulator um, that would regulate the entire tax profession. Um, again, uh, the professional associations suggested at that stage that um, already operating in the profession, already uh, to a certain extent voluntarily regulating the, the tax practitioners uh, through the affiliation and membership and subject, being subject to a code of conduct, um, it was recommended and, and suggested to Revenue and to Treasury that why not use the existing professional bodies who may already have a very well functioning um, disciplinary structures, uh, code of conduct, standards that would meet the objectives of government as well as protecting the public. So revenue went back to the drawing board and they considered it throughout uh, 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 two, three years until we saw in last, 2012, sorry there's a, there's a mistake, in 2012, we saw an amendment to the Tax Administration Act um, that, would, that, that presented the regulatory regime that, like, that we've currently got on the table, um, which I will allude to in a, in a, in a, in a moment. Um, those of you who have followed the budget speech last year would have noted that um, this whole regulation came back to the fore, even though the professional bodies back in 2009 suggested to SARS that probably uh, the, ex the existing professional bodies are filling a, 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 a sufficient role for regulation. Still, they saw a, a, a sharp increase in the levels of non-compliance uh, in personal capacities of tax practitioners. Uh, and that created uh, a, a massive concern that, like the minister highlighted in the budget speech, if practitioners are 
uh, so lax about their own personal tax affairs. Um, what can you? What is this going on behind um, the scenes with regards to the service to taxpayers? Um, so yeah, any questions on that? Okay. Now, yes. Both the Minister and SARS on numerous occasions have mentioned that very point that tax practitioners, affairs are not even known. And when they've been challenged to report those practitioners who are members of public, of, uh, public bodies, or professional bodies, sorry, to the professional body, not once have they done that. Okay, I'll, I'll quickly explain. Um, yeah, the problem, sorry, the problem is that they're tarnishing the entire profession with making comments like that, and they can't back up these problems. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. Vinnie, would you like to say something? Um, Vinnie Henson is from SARS and uh, from the stakeholder division, so she would just like to uh, ask her to fill in from time to time. Um, Please. I, I don't know how comfortable I'm doing this. I'm also I'm not supposed to have to say anything at this. But I think at the beginning there was this whole confidentiality agreement where SARS wasn't allowed to, to reveal the, the affairs or the issues around one particular tax practitioner yes. around that. You'll see in Section 240 we've actually written it in yes. to give ourselves the, the opportunity or the legal right to be able to say to an association, practitioner X. Yeah is um, not complying with the required requisite, um, uh, well, with the requirements to be efficient in that particular space. So that is covered this time round. Um, yeah, I, 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 sorry, I'm I can, I, I can confirm that. I think if you, you, you must understand one of the fundamental principles in the Bill of Rights of the Constitution is the right to privacy. Um, and, and for SARS to, to infringe that by, for example, reporting a tax practitioner's personal information uh, of non-compliance to his or her professional body um, would be problematic. So, so they, ha they had, and especially the, in the old Section 4 in the Income Tax Act, the secrecy provisions would, would, which would give um, effect to the privacy um, clause in the Bill of Rights. Um, so, one, it was one of my concerns as well at the state at, at, at that point in time that the minister did not address it with uh, or communicated, or the commi commissioner communicated the levels of non compliance with the professional body so that we can be in a position, at least uh, from an from a alert perspective, not naming, uh, but that was an oversight. And I think at that stage, um, when that information came to the fore uh, from, from a SARS perspective, um, internally, um, almost like stratifying the it's different sectors and industries, uh, tax practitioners came almost like out of the woodworks. So it was really all of a sudden, um, and it wasn't anticipated. Um, yes, we knew uh, practitioners were, there are levels of non-compliance, but we didn't know the extent of it. And I do think that e-filing also assisted, uh, and modernization of SARS assisted, uh, and facilitated the process to be able to get that intelligence. Um, and, and so, reflecting on, on the matter, I think um, one needs to appreciate the fact that SARS, um, even though the day that, that the Revenue Authority uh, struggled to collect the required taxes, still followed the principle. Uh, of the constitution of uh, subjecting and um, appreciating the right to privacy. Uh, now the legislation has got a specific focus. Uh, now it's in the public interest. Now, based on section um, uh, 36 of the constitution, saying that you uh, a law um, that's subject to general application and defined can be then you then the the bill of rights. Um, um, condition that they should respect privacy uh, is now subject to the national interest of ensuring that this, this sector are compliant uh, and therefore practitioners in the system can be reported to his or her recognized controlling body. So it was just a legal matter um, 
that was cleared up now, and now we've seen the regulation. So carrying on, in terms of chapter... Sorry. Yes. A quick word there. Yes. Um, I think part of the problem was the way it was put across. Tax practitioners are not compliant. In fact, I think most of the sort of were probably a few who are very non-compliant. Everybody else is very compliant. If it had been fully good percentage, five percent are not compliant, they owe a lot. Yeah. That would be a different way of putting it. And I do think the idea of having a tax clearance certificate for tax practitioners may be suspended without help scale one way to stop them. Yeah. yeah, but luckily uh, for us now that the R regulation, now we can we can illustrate to the public that those who are now regulated and recognized by and registered with a professional body, uh, controlling body, um, that you are indeed getting rid of the bad apples in the system. So in the long run, I, I, I realized at that point in time, taking a photo, at that point in time, it w we also felt that everyone are ta brushed with this, or, uh, tarred with the same brush, is that the right saying? Um, but looking back now, I think um, we need to we need to commend the process um, and 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 support it as those who are taking chances in the system uh, and who are not not qualified and and charging 100 rand for a tax return that's actually cutting your throats while doing a professional job um, it's you will actually benefit in the long run and and obviously your clients who thought that you are um, that you are one of those non-compliant practitioners would now see you still around so it's an ideal opportunity, a marketing opportunity now, also for you to, to turn that around and, and um, say that I'm subjected to the regulation and I'm a professional person. And I think um, there's not, no such thing as bad publicity. Um, you can turn it around um, in, in your favor. Looking at the, the current regulatory regime, an overview, where do we find this? Section 18 of the TAA uh, deals with um, deals with this whole regulatory regime. So those of you have your act in front of you, am I right? Yes. Section 18, or chapter 18. And then um, I'm quickly going to refer to some of the sections. So I'm, I, didn't, I didn't copy and paste it because it's always best to read out of the act. Um, otherwise, information gets lost in translation. So looking at um, section 239, um, it deals with definitions. There are definitions. Um, Defining a controlling body and a recognized controlling body, and then tax practitioner, registered tax practitioner are deleted. So, interpreting the TAA, the reason why I wanted to quickly st st emphasize the definitions in this specific chapter, at first face value, you see the term registered tax practitioner no longer in the Act, it's, it's repealed. But how the TAA is written is that it has overarching definitions in section one, and this is where they've moved the registered tax practitioner definition thereof. As, why? Because the word the registered tax practitioner are now also referred to in other sections. Um, because there are certain rights and, and, and privileges now given to tax practitioners. So the good thing about this whole regulation again is the fact that when you write opinions uh, and it's written by a registered tax practitioner, if you have to remit penalties and you relied on a opinion uh, developed by a registered tax practitioner, then there are certain um, reductions uh, in the penalties um, that SARS must consider. So that's why it's moved to the front. So you won't find it anywhere here. So whenever you deal with other chapters um, of the TAA, remember there are specific chapter definitions and there are overarching definitions uh, that's applicable to the entire TAA. Okay. So still, the regulation... Con uh, distinguishes between a controlling body and a recognized controlling body. As you know, there are five re uh, recognized controlling bodies. Um, uh, ourselves, the Institute of Tax Practitioners, the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants, the South African Institute of Professional Accountants, the South African Institute of Chartered Secretaries, and then the Institute of Accounting and Commerce. Okay. So th those five bodies are recognized controlling bodies as defined in section 239 and then are, and as well the automatically recognized controlling bodies are the, uh, the law societies, the bar councils as well as the independent regulatory board for auditors. Um, so those 
eight sectors, not sectors, uh, I can't say bodies because law societies are four law societies, but the law societies, the bars, um, uh, urba, and then these five controlling bodies who are now taking the position as recognized controlling bodies for the purposes of section 241. Uh, 240 and 241, chapter 18. Um, you'll see, and I'll, I'll get into it in a moment, the question arises, why should we now distinguish between a controlling body and a recognized controlling body? And I'll explain it that to you in a moment as well. Okay, so then, in terms of what do we, re do we regulate this profession? Um, first of all, section 240 requires all tax practitioners um, uh, every natural person who provides advice to another person uh, or completes or assists in completing any return to register or fall under the jurisdiction of a recognized controlling body by no later than the 1st of July this year or within 21 um, with our business, our business days after the date on which the, for the first time they render such a service as defined in section 241. Um, then Yes. Just hold on for the camera. We just need to record. Thanks, Paul. Um, just with regard to that 240, it deals with natural persons. So here we have a complete, without even a thought, look through of corporate identity. So many of the practitioners trade as incorporated practice. That's a company. Um, it is the entity that's giving the advice. It is the entity that is generating the fee notes. It is the entity that's receiving the funds. And yet, the practitioner underlying that is the one that must be registered, without any thought about whether we're piercing veils or not piercing veils. Uh, Paul, I'll, I'll explain to you, and this is why I said I want to refer to the policy behind this regulation. Um, and one need to understand what the objectives are and, and then read the legislation in that context. Now, you cannot put a, a, a corporate in a witness box. The ultimate, the ultimate is, is, uh, thank you for answering, asking that question now because I actually didn't put it in the end, uh, what I wanted to say in my objectives. So I thought I'll deal with it as we go along. So it's good to be clarified up front. Um, ultimately, the regulation is to protect the public. Yes, secondary SARS will also be protected. The self-assessment system um, are exposing the revenue authority and the country and the FISC uh, to, uh, towards um, either exploitation or mistakes, whether it is uh, grossly negligent or whether it is by, uh, by, by purpose. And we need a level of accountability um, from practitioners being the intermediary between the public who ultimately takes responsibility for that return and the information and what ultimately ends up in the self-assessment system. Because the self-assessment system, and uh, Sars didn't tell me this, I just argue this from a pure logical perspective. Um, I actually hopefully one that I can say whether this is indeed true or whether this is by accident that this is happening. But my view of this is if you have tax practitioners who are either incompetent or uh, making gross errors by not putting the capital nature items in the right line, SARS's risk engines at the back are written in such a way as to pick up and flag certain items and link it back to the financial statements and thereby picking up um, where further verification is required. So if you're not applying your work with the required diligence, then SARS may or may not pick up or flag an item for further investigation. Obviously the Revenue Authority needs to be as efficient as possible. So if we make a mistake and since, and let's say you fill in a, 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 a an income or an expense, uh, gross income on a certain line item, which is wrong or grouped it, all under gross income and not or in specific deductions, not properly, then you may either send SARS auditors or SARS assessment down barking up the wrong tree and therefore wasting their time because they thought it is a risk, but because you made an error, actually there was no error. They, they actually spent time and all subjecting the taxpayer to an audit 
We didn't know why they ordered it. Are you with me? It's been nine out of ten times my experience has been from, from a professional body is that that is it's mistakes grouping of expenses or grouping of income which is not adequately um, broken up um, into into the required fields. Uh, and the other the other side is also true. The risk engines are written in such a way that when you do put legal fees, for example, in a, in a, in a certain uh, block on a return, um, then they may require a schedule of le those legal fees. So again, the system is written, gone are the days where SARS, an official, would, would look at the financial statements, look at the tax return, and do an eye over or easy over the return, and thereby picking up um, uh, mistakes or fraud or whatever it may be. So it's in the interest of the whole system to, to, to clear it of all the clogging um, that's happening. Um, we, you, you, you practitioners, I've never been a practitioner, so um, you practitioners would have experienced that IT14 is the problem last year. Obviously, I know a lot of what's happening in practice because I hear that every day um, of the whole country. So at least I know what, at it's least... It's not only last year, it's this year just as bad as Maybe that's part of the problem. But it's growing out of a risk area which isn't really a risk area. Yeah. I think it's. Well, no. I'm sorry, Mike, you can look at that. Okay. Um, you know, that, that's one of the reasons, the issue like you're picking up with the IT14 is, is, is one of the reasons that we put in the kind of new model that is in place. Because the whole idea around the recognized controlling body and the way it's defined and what it means in terms of practice is that we have special relationships with these controlling bodies. And the issues that you're experiencing with your membership, for example, your excitement that this is coming up as an issue, is something that you would bring to these regular meeting sessions. They're no longer at all. They've set into an agreement. We will try and address these issues as closely as possible. So over and above the registration, which is the and the fixing of the issues around ethics and quality of work that is produced, which is the essential bare bones of this process. The other thing is also to make sure that we, we, we've granted this recognition controlling body status, for want of a better word. Um, but it means that the relationships hopefully get better as we go on as well. Absolutely. And, sorry. and it's not a one-step thing. It, it, it is a continuous thing. It will go on for a period of time and we'll be able to measure it. So we're hoping that this will allow these things, these kind of issues where we're falling down as well to surface. And just to add on to that, again, looking at the spirit of this regulation, this, and this is what Verney has just referred to, looking at, that's not written into the law. There are no legal requirement for SARS to, to really work with us on that official level. But if you look at SARS as a slogan, it's uh, at your service. And, we do, and uh, please don't throw with, with apples or uh, uh, what, uh, tomatoes. But I think we all recognize, and, and again, sitting, sitting on the International Tax Directors Forum, who have engaged the SARS last year when we hosted the International CEOs Forum in Cape Town, um, SARS presented, and they were amazed about um, about the level of sophistication and the level of dedication um, at face value, not on proof of what SAR said, but one, what they could see the systems doing. So uh, it wasn't coloured in a certain in a certain uh, way that would that would impress these uh, foreign CEOs of tax institutes. Um, but they they saw the level of of dedication in making sure that the system is serving the country and serving the practitioners and the taxpayers. So, so what Vinny alluded to is the fact that as uh, recognized controlling bodies, we would be uh, meeting uh, even on a more uh, regular basis and on a more dedicated basis with, with uh, SARS in clearing up and addressing issues of this nature uh, that you may experience in the system. Um, so, Paul, I hope I answered your question. Um, so, yeah, so, and uh, the other thing I didn't mention to you is who's going to stand in the witness box? So, it's, 
you, you can't put a juristic person in a witness box. You can have a representative taxpayer, um, a representative tax practitioner, yes, maybe. But the question is, Paul, and this is the question I'm asking the big four as well, because they believe that only the, the, the partners need to be registered in the terms of the Act. Now, when I turn it around and I ask, are you prepared for your manager? If your manager make a mistake or a problem or is acting unethically or whatever, are you prepared because you've given an eye over or reviewed the work? You haven't checked everything. Remember in taxation there are no such thing as materiality. In auditing there are such a thing as, such as materiality. So you take your lead schedule, your income, your, your income sheet, uh, you multiply it by 28%, you say, okay, Yes, my materiality is 200,000 rand, so all expenses below 200,000 rand, I'm not verifying or auditing. That's what you do when you do audit. You do, you give assurance. In tax, there are no such thing as assurance. You're a taxpayer responsible for 100% declaration of, uh, of his or her liability. Okay. So, looking then at the regulation of tax practitioners, who are going to stand in the witness box? So, if there's a mistake made, so... I, I'm not prepared, not even for our financial manager at the institute. If she made a mistake on the tax return, there's no way I'm going to, or our VAT return, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to take responsibility for that. I'll rather register her. Because she's filling in the return, she's submitting the, the VAT return, even if I do give it an eye over. I don't have, otherwise I have to reproduce the whole VAT return for me to be saying I'm comfortable taking responsibility and then be able to lose my license to practice going forward. And that's the question that you need to ask as practitioners. Are you prepared to be disciplined and potentially losing your, pra your, your, your license to be a professional and then that guy made a mistake, setting up shop and taking all the clients the following week? And that's the question. Paul. But then do you want all of our staff to register? I mean, the whole move about this, this last from the 2009 tax practitioners where many firms registered the delivery personnel. Now, that person has a very important task of delivering the check on time. Now, if that person says he delivered it on time, and he and SARS says he didn't deliver it on time, then that, is an, then that is something that he must become accountable for. But SARS doesn't want all the delivery people on the tax practitioner role. But I'm saying, I'm not going to be responsible for the delivery person not delivering the check on time because that's his function um, of doing it as part of the tax process. I'm just taking it to an extreme example. Yes, no, no. Uh, <laughs> and then now must every one of my staff be registered because they, once, as you say, I don't review everything in the process, I review parts of the process. So must everyone, do, do we want to have in our office instead of 16, do we want to have 250? Is that, is that what we want? Because, I mean, every article clock fills out part of the company tax return. The partner does not review the entire company tax return. So is that what we want? Vernie, I think you can highlight, but I, before Vernie before Verne say anything, um, again, um, let's argue the other way around. Your tax payer client uh, submit to you a logbook. Have you scrutinized that logbook? That, first of all, he's do he does have a car in his name that he can claim traveling. Or is it, the, is it, is it the, that car that he's claiming lo uh, traveling on is actually registered in a company? Uh, or is he now claiming traveling expenses? So you need to apply your mind. And I'll get that in a moment. My time are running out. Um, but I do think these are the type of things, and I've highlighted a few issues, other issues I would like to also highlight. So this is something that needs more time to discuss, and we're going to flesh it out, Paul. Um, but I do think you as a professional need to make the decision. Are you prepared? And if you, if you believe that you are under the direct supervision and you're and you are reviewing it, and you've applied your mind, and you've checked working papers. Remember, I think, uh, ultimately, practitioners up to date were not required to keep any working papers. And I'll tell you later, reading the Act, uh, again, looking at the spirit, looking at the risk of you losing your practicing license. Um, as what we're going to do as a controlling body, what we're going to look at. I'll get to that in a moment. So maybe once you've heard everything, let's then 
debate it and say, say whether it's still uh, okay. Uh, because I've got a solution to the messenger problem. So then if you just hold back that answer, because we also, those are the questions we ask asking SARS as well. Um, again, SARS, see the problems in the system, that's why they're regulating, um, but let's see how we, can, how we can get through everything. So I'm going to, I probably still, may still steal five minutes, but I'll give you five minutes, even if you have to steal some of our own um, uh, tea time. Is it okay? Is that fine? Okay. I do think it's impo important thing because when, once you leave this conference, uh, there are so many things you need to put in place in your practices, but I don't think the, the community really recognizes as a, you ha you'll, you'll have a different practice altogether under this regulated regime. And I'll, I'll tell you why I'm saying that in a moment. Um, okay, and then recognition of controlling bodies. I'm not going to go into detail. If you want further detail on that and how the process worked, all I can say, it has been a consultative process. It has been an absolute um, very, uh, rigorous uh, verification process and a transparent process. Um, there, has, there has not been any favoritism in the system. Uh, some, of, some of you may ask me, but how can a chartered instead of secretaries, company secretaries, how can they be tax practitioners? They've got a section of practitioners and they met the requirements set by the consultative process. All interested bodies were part of setting the, the, the criteria for recognition of controlling bodies with SARS, we all delivered comment, we all debated it, and we all agreed to it. So uh, it has been, it, even though it may not, so, it, it, may, it may sound absurd, how can a, a, a company secretary be a tax practitioner? They have a section of their membership uh, specializing in, 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 as tax practitioners, and the professional body met the requirements. So um, that's the answer. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail in terms of section 240A. Um, uh, recognition controlling bodies, and then moving on to section 241, uh, complaint to a controlling body. Um, now, as I mentioned to you in the definitions, there are, th there are distinctions now between a controlling body and a recognized controlling body. The reason being, why this is section 241.1 and 241.2, where uh, different complaints can be laid to different sections of practitioners, whether they belong to controlling body. And let's take an example, ACCA, those of you know, ACCA and SEMA, um, and uh, what other controlling bodies are the uh, Institute of Certified Bookkeepers, Association of Account Technicians. Um, there are 18 accountancy related professional bodies, of which only five of them were granted recognition of controlling body uh, con status. Okay? They still remain controlling bodies as defined in Section 239. Okay? And even other bodies, such as the uh, Financial Planning Institute, even the Law Society, uh, will be, uh, pr practitioners who may only do litigation, okay, let's take an attorney, for example, or even an FBI member, Financial Planning Institute member, who are not recognized, but by virtue, they've got an agreement with us as a professional body, a recognized cr controlling body, that we would regulate the tax practitioner members by becoming affiliate members of the Institute. Okay, the Act allows for, for that, uh, falling under the jurisdiction of a recognized controlling body. Because FBI, the Fiduciary Institute of South Africa, the Institute of Certified Bookkeepers, the South African Institute for Business Accountants, and the uh, Financial Intermediate Association members who also specialize in taxation, they decided that they would uh, subscribe and sign an agreement with our institute, SAIT, to regulate their tax practitioner members. But our condition was that we would give them preferential membership rates because they're already primarily registered with that body, um, and then we would do the disciplining function and the continuing education um, uh, function for, the, for those uh, members. Looking, coming back to Section 241, why are there distinction between a recognized, SARS can complain to a controlling body who are not recognized, so why do they want to complain? It's an instance where, for example, you've got an attorney um, who are not a registered tax practitioner because he's not required, because in his practice it is really incidental, or even a state planner who are really doing a very small tax function, but still breaches one of those four um, um, complaint uh, issues or um, um, offenses, let's call it an offense for lack of a better word. Not in a strict sense, otherwise Kerry will, st will chastise me, uh, but not in a, from an attorney's perspective, but from a, from a, from a misconduct perspective. Um, so SARS would still be able to complain to that controlling body. And then going back, jump to section two, four, 243, SARS would still then have a look 
at how that controlling body then um, disciplined that person. And if not necessarily because they're not geared to do it, then the minister can appoint a retired judge to do that. Okay, and that's also the reason why there's a fallback in section 243 uh, that says uh, that the minister can appoint a retired judge to look at, uh, to discipline in on behalf of that body. Okay, because they may not have standards, uh, uh, disciplinary standards relevant to taxation to be able to adequately address one of those four issues and that resulted in a complaint. Doesn't make sense. Okay, then looking at, and this is the important one for you, and this is actually, we, sp we spoke 45 minutes now, but this is, this is the crux of the regulation, because this is what is trying to, the policy objective is for SARS and the public to lay a complaint against the tax practitioner who have breached one of those six things stipulated in section 241.2. Now those of you who have your act, please open it quickly. Let's quickly go through it, because I, ne I would like to highlight, and I've, we've tried to, to create a discussion in tax talk on this, um, more than what I'm going to share with you, but I'm just going to point you in the right direction to re in reading this um, and then also to apply your minds as a professional to make sure that you gear yourself and your practice um, for this regulation. Now, looking at section 241.2a, now, a senior sales official may lodge a complaint with a recognized controlling body if a registered tax practitioner, in the opinion of the official, without exercising due diligence, prepared or assisted in the preparation, approval or submission of any return affidavit or other document. Now document is defined again in section 1 of TAA. That's anything, any communication with SARS, okay. I, I don't think the TAA all referred to a re return really anymore. It's the, the word document, the return is defined in the, in, the, in the definition as a document. So whenever you read a TAA and you read the word document, it's a overarching definition it includes a, de a return. Um, so the focus there is under, you can highlight or underline exercising due diligence. Okay, there are no definition of due diligence in the act. Okay, you can go to section 1, you can go to section 239, you won't find anything. So the, the question is still what is due diligence? Bringing back the, the issue of materiality into the equation, um, when, you, when, you, when you do anything else in terms of ordinary dictionary meaning of the word uh, exercise in diligence. Um, practitioners, as I pointed out earlier, merely take the information given by the taxpayer and submit it. Now the act are saying that if you haven't exercised due diligence in submitting the return as a professional, then you are opening up yourself for a complaint. So no longer are you merely a post box because within why do you charge a fee for it? If you want to be a post box, uh, then you're not a professional. If you want to be a professional, you need to take a level of accountability um, when you deal with the public. Okay, and there are also no standards in the in the in the sector and the profession of 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 uh, standard, not standards, standard, one standard of practice. Okay, some practices do more work, and then you lose your clients. Others do it fly by night; they've got more clients. Maybe, maybe not, but that's sometimes the case. And charging a lesser fee and or charging a contingency fee, okay, which are also no longer um, allowed. So for those of you who belong to, now, again, time not permitting, uh, those of you who are registered tax practitioners, you need to consult your applicable professional body's code of conduct. And it has been updated recently due to the recognition of controlling bodies uh, status that has been granted. We will certainly issue a detailed uh, memo to our members uh, in the next week. Um, now that uh, the, the bodies have been recognized in terms of, in terms of chapter 18, uh, to be able to alert members as to the amended code of conduct and the requirements of practice of tax practitioners. One of them is contingency fees, okay, on, uh, are not allowed unless explicitly, ex explicitly allowed in terms of the contingency fees act. Okay, but we will give guidance to members and um, highlight the pertinence. So, diligence. So, what does it mean? Let's go on before I answer that. Uh, unreasonably delayed the financialization of any matter before SARS. So, if you, if you without being reasonable, delayed uh, holding back um, 
then you would be subjecting yourself or opening yourself up for a complaint. If you give an opinion contrary to clear law, recklessly or through gross incompetence, if you act like that, you would be opening up yourself. Now again, how long is a string? I'm mentioning to you, whenever you consider this, don't, if you've studied auditing, don't put your audit hat on when you do tax, because there are no such things with reality. Okay, so if you can, an auditor, if a mistake I picked up, Ernst Young I recently exposed through the Google saga, those of you who follow the international tax news, um, from an auditor perspective, it'll be easier for them not to be charged or be accused of acting reckless or grossly incompetent by verifying certain disclosures on their financial statements. Versus you as a tax practitioner, a registered tax practitioner, where there are no such things as materiality, um, now you're getting closer to being, to being guilty of that. Can you, can you see what I'm trying to say here? And it, it, it comes back to professional judgment. Secondly, you need to keep proper working paper files. Why? Because if a, if a complaint are leveled against you in terms of section 241 uh, one or 2, then a de facto court hearing will happen, a disciplinary process. Okay? Hopefully none of you have been ever subjected to disciplinary action by a professional body. But what's going to happen? You stand a chance of losing your license, your livelihood. Do you agree? Because you've got the risk, you're under risk of being struck off the roll, losing the, your practice, your license to practice for five years. You cannot go to another professional body. Okay? So if you're a member of anybody, let's say you're primarily a member of SICA and they struck you off the roll, you discipline, you struck off the role, then you cannot come to site or to another professional body or recognized controlling body. Okay. So what you're going to go into? Fight or flight mode. You're either going to leave the country, okay, or you're going to fight. What are you going to do? You're going to appoint an attorney. Okay. We certainly as an institute know that. So we have geared ourselves for the process to make sure that we give our members who are disciplined a fair hearing, Okay, subject to the constitutional principles of the country, um, make sure that you get a fair hearing. But what's going to happen? You're going to appoint an attorney to assist you on the disciplinary matter. We accepted the, day fa the, 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 the rules of the High Court and the rules of the Supreme Court of Appeal uh, as our uh, rules of court in terms of the disciplinary process that we follow whenever we get a complaint in terms of Section 240, 241. So we will allow you representation. Okay, so what's going to happen? You're going to stand up. Those of you who studied account, auditing and accounting would know that in a witness box, your audit working paper file need to stand up for it self. Do you agree? So this may be a foreign and new concept to you. You don't have to make, to a certain extent, you can argue, where do we draw the line in terms of keeping working papers? Where do we draw the line in terms of um, practicing with required diligence? Okay. You need to ask yourself the question. If the guy comes in with a Porsche and is only declaring 60,000 rand income on his return, is that, does it make sense to me? And if you cannot document that you have considered that, and anybody else, can it, will it stand up for scrutiny when you are disciplined? Okay. Have you applied your mind as a professional? Um, then. And, you, and you, if you document it and you, and you can satisfy in your working papers that you've considered the this, this situation, this guy, this guy is a trust fund baby, he only gets whatever, if you document it and you've considered it, you have discharged of your duty in terms of applying your mind. Then you're okay. But if you don't do that, and it comes out that SARS ordered this taxpayer, okay? So they will show me when I must stop talking. Um, Okay, can we carry on to section 241.2d, uh, being grossly, sorry. I'm getting to that in a moment. Can I answer that? Then, yes. The other question is, is professional indemnity insurance going to be compulsory for tax practitioners? 
Okay, I'll answer that also. Thank you. Um, the gentleman asked um, if he belonged to more than one professional body um, and how that can be dealt with. And the second question is professional indemnity insurance. And then Paul asked um, whether this is regulation is not really for extending um, uh, protection for the public but are actually extending the SARS audit capabilities. Answering question one, uh, if you belong to more than one professional body, the SARS registration process would ask you which of these professional bodies are your primary body that you consider as your primary body. Okay. I'll leave it at that because that would require uh, certain discussions off record with SARS in terms of how do we deal with that process because we don't want as a professional body that our, me our members would then list themselves with one of the other four recognized controlling bodies who've got lesser standards than us. Because I can say this uh, with all um, certainty and um, not being uh, uh, arrogant and that is that site has got dedicated tax standards and a disciplinary code of conduct. Even though there are minimum code of conduct set by SARS in terms of this recognition requirements, we've got um, specific uh, additional requirements as a professional body to ensure that we protect it's our fellow members standing. Uh, we, we don't want scandals on hand where our members are not performing certain additional professional work on a return and in their practice, okay? So we will deal with that um, at, uh, at the appropriate forum and, and, and as, as the recognized controlling bodies ensure that there are set of standards, standard for the regulation of tax practitioners. On the professional indemnity insurance, um, professional indemnity insurance, if you, if you read the, the, the fine print on professional indemnity insurance, if you have made uh, uh, certain errors, if you're not covered, okay? So as a professional body, we believe, and I know that there, there, is, um, there is hype in certain professional bodies that we have mandatory uh, uh, professional damage insurance. Globally, if you look at other institutes, it's all recommended to them for the member. Okay, the members should get that if they need um, insurance. It's like car insurance. We cannot say to you have to have car insurance. Okay, but we recommend it. Okay, and it will not pay out for the five years you can sit at home, not be able to practice. Your professional damage insurance won't cover that. Okay, I haven't seen any insurance product that would cover that. So you will also, when you struck off the roll, um, I can't see that any insurance would touch you uh, or make any payment out. Okay. So in, in I'm not asking the question from the tax practitioner's side. Yeah. I'm asking the question from a public protection point of view. So to protect the public and have insurance. Oh, I see. So if you submit a return late, that uh, and these penalties and interest, um, but that's a normal. Doesn't matter. Remember how in, uh, professional indemnity insurance work. Even though you've got professional indemnity insurance on your on your practice on your on your on your, on your uh, yeah on your practice, then if that if you make a mistake, you can claim, but never pay it over to the taxpayer. Okay. So again, it's but who's who's got. The, the, who can challenge you if you submit the return late? It's a, a litigation between the taxpayer and the tax practitioner. So you can still keep that money back. So we, we, we can never ensure, unless the money is paid to us, if you, if you, if we, if we, we will certainly look at professional damage insurance where the money is paid to us and we can act as a trust and pay to the taxpayer or to SARS to make sure that we can consider. But currently there are no professional damage insurance in Africa that I'm aware of where it's paid to the institute and then uh, on behalf of the member making a mistake and thereby protecting the public. L most of the times that money, if ever, that gets paid, like most insurance, if it gets paid, either I haven't seen that money end up in the pocket of either SARS or, um, because at that stage, the practice are so down the drain that there are other debts and stuff where that money goes into to get paid. So really, when you get, land up in that situation, um, is already long gone. We kept the interesting subject for the graveyard session um, because this is really going to rattle uh, the practices. Um, a new level of professionalism is instilled through this regulation and I don't think 
that everyone realizes that. And I do think that in the 2004 slash 5 regulation and registration, the, 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 the light handed approach, people think that is the approach going to be now. It's not. There's a completely different level of. Uh, it's like the. Yeah. There was a, so I've answered your questions. Okay, we will hear from Mohammed because I know Cyber. Okay. I have a different view. I mean, all the best of them. Uh, I just have one different view. You see, the, the, the view I am trying to take is that, you see, all professions are regulated. If you're an engineer, you belong to a professional body. If you are uh, a doctor, you belong to a professional body. So, if all professions are regulated, why should the tech sector should be exempt from that regulation? And if you look at global, everybody talks about global corporate government. It's a global phenomenon. It's an attempt to regulate all professionals. So in that light, you will look at it. There's only one profession that has never been regulated, and that's a tax practitioner. And if you look at court cases, you will see all of it when the teams are involved. It's an accountant who is part of that team. Or the lawyer. Or the lawyer. <laughs> I, think I know at Saipa you think that uh, the taxation is accounting. <laughs> So what I'm trying to argue is that if all professional bodies are regulated, why should the tax practitioner be exempted from any form of regulation? Yes. That's the point I'm trying to put. Because after after Anderson and everybody else and global schemes, there's a global move to a regulation professional body. But I still make one point. I was making the point that we see this regulation not suspiciously. Everybody else is regulated, but we are regulated as well. That's the point I'm trying to make. The last point is that but you're going to make one point together. I like it. You must become a, you should have been an attorney. Okay. Kerry, what do you think? Right. Now, you think you might have very quickly. One last question. One last question. I have my doubt whether your insurance company should pay for your medicine behavior. Are you with me? Yeah. Yeah. So similarly, if you have a satisfactory behavior, in farm court to be guilty of an offense. I think, from a private view, that whether the indemnity insurance should cover somebody calculated and deliberate misdemeanor. So what I'm trying to argue is that although you may have indemnity insurance, I begin to question that whether it should cover you if you act willfully and awfully. That's what I'm trying to raise. Well done. Okay, but nonetheless, I do think that if I see my claims in the past with insurance, um, I have to answer lots of questions. Exactly, did the, 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 the cell phone, was it on my lap? Was it hidden away? Was it in the pocket in the side? All I'm saying is, don't rely on in insurance. Safeguard your car, okay? Don't, don't leave your car with the keys in, okay? Don't, don't look for trouble. That's all I'm saying. So what are the, so specific important issues, some of them we've touched on. So Kerry, I'll promise you, I'll, pro, I'll, cut, I'll, I'll wrap up in the next few, um, four minutes. Um, are existing tax practitioners re registered with SARS required to re-register by 1 July? Okay. Um, the answer is no. Okay. There will be an update and I've cleared this uh, with, with legal and policy at SARS. They were, uh, uh, okay, here's the question. Now that the Tax Admin Act came in, just to explain to you what the argument is, when the new Tax Admin Act came in, that all existing taxpayers now have to re-register under the Tax Admin Act? Or, to, or should we make, are we required to make transitionary provisions for that? There are no transitionary provisions with regards to uh, the registration uh, registered tax practitioners. Uh, but there will be an update requirement for the, to make sure that, SARS, that you comply with the new requirements. Okay, so no debate on that. Um, what is the intention of the legislator under the direct supervision? The intention is you need to determine. Um, it's not auditing, not material, remember there's no materiality. If you, start, if you prepare to stand in the witness box, um, if you prepare to do that, then don't register, then direct supervise if you're prepared. And obviously, the lower you go down the... The, the hierarchy in a, in a tax practice or an accounting practice, uh, the more directly supervised the individual become. Do you agree? So, um, but if you if if you are, if you prepared to allow your practice, um, 
if you trust the person, remember this level of trust, remember when you do auditing, you consider management integrity, do you agree? Okay, you consider the controls, you consider the risks that these companies got. And depending on the risk areas, you'll delve into more detail in that area, you'll give it more professional attention. Okay, equally here, yeah. if, you, if you know your person doing their work and you supervise them, and you can trust them, then don't register them. But if there are a chance of you ending up in as the, the, as the direct supervisor, and if you prepare to take the risk, then don't register. But if you're not, then register your staff, okay? And that's a professional judgment, and that's a professional um, uh, decision. I would say take the conservative approach and register them. It's easy, it's not expensive, you also subject them to a professional set of rules, so actually it makes your, your life easier. Because how long, does, how long is it taking you to supervise that individual? Okay, so don't just think it from the perspective of, then you know what, we have to pay 2,000 rand, 1,500 rand, 1,900, whatever the fee may be for membership for this individual. But think of the level of number one, confidence you're instilling in that individual, and number two, um, you now know that person is accountable. That person is um, subjected to continuing professional development. So take a list, consider all the facts, um, but I think if, if, if I had a practice with 20 staff or 50 staff, I would register them on uh, maybe a certain band. I would make a decision. If it's, if it's really tax return preparers there in the office where the manager for the compliance division are reviewing every single thing and reviewing the working paper file, then don't register them. But once you go to manager and consulting level, consultant level, um, sub make, make, them, make them a professional. Maybe you think you have to pay them more now. Okay? They really have got the, if they meet the professional qualification, it doesn't mean that you must pay them more now. So that's, all the, that's almost like a remuneration policy decision you have to take into. But I don't think that would increase your cost. Actually, it would decrease your level of supervision. And it will increase your cost. It's like an auditing. If you, can, if you can rely on the controls of the company, your materiality and your t a substantive testing are less. You have to chase less invoices because, number one, I can rely on management to have sufficient segregation of duties. Are you with me what I'm trying to say here? Okay, so really, this is a small fee to pay to gain a lot more. Really go think about it critically, and I'm still happy to hear your views off record outside because I can't Still more minutes. I've already taken another extra minute. Okay, next one. Why controlling body versus recognized controlling body? I explain that to you. Uh, how will dual membership work? SARS would um, would uh, require uh, you to list your or identify your primary body who you elect to be disciplined with. Okay, uh, not that we'll get there, but uh, because the professional bodies that has been recognized and the statutory ones are really uh, will will assist you in making sure that you are acting professionally and subjecting you to a certain level of continued professional development and guidance technically to ensure that your practice also go to the next level. This whole process will elevate the status of your service. Um, how does materiality impact tax practice? I told you, one rent, uh, one rent you under declare, there are no such thing as materiality. Okay, if you look at the admin penalties in the Act, if you look at the criminal uh, sanctions in the Act, Minor things are like, well, not minor. If something's criminally chargeable, then it's serious. But it's a thing that we consider as not serious, in, because if you don't kill a person, then it, it, we think it's not serious, okay? Or certain people might think that. But certain things are, if it's criminally prosecutable, then, um, then, um, then it's serious. And materiality needs to be considered in the process, or should not be considered in the process, whether it's material or not. Not updating certain details may be a criminal offense, and thereby serious. But if you look at it from an audit perspective, you know what? The mistake is less than half a million, half a million, because that's my materiality, so let's ignore it. Okay. In tax, it doesn't work like that. It's under the declaration and therefore a criminal offense. Um, what are the minimum standards and pra tax practice in the context of gross negligence and due diligence? At site, we've got tax taxation standards. We, as recognized controlling bodies, will be meeting very soon and we will discuss it amongst the group with SARS in terms of setting certain standards to assist U.S. practitioners. Those of you who are with SITE, 
obviously we guide you and we'll help you to make sure and we will do roadshows to, to implement and to make sure we smoothly implement this new process, making sure that you meet the requirements of proper working paper files uh, and to what extent do you verify a logbook, for example. What do you do? Do you, take, do you only take the... No, I, can, I can discuss this hours at the end. Any other questions on your, from your side? Okay, but can you see you have to think differently? I think that's the message that I'm trying to get across, is that you, you need to consider yourself as a true professional because you want to charge a professional fee, okay, and not only be in a post box, okay, and therefore all information going through your hands need to be evaluated critically um, and with a level of professional judgment. There's a, there's a question at the back. So yeah, I know you've run out of time. Can you give us uh, an email address or something where people can just send things through to you so that you can send the parts back and out to everybody else? We've been thinking this thing through, obviously with discussions with the industry, with SARS, uh, everybody. Obviously we will try as far as possible to give a uniformed, frequently asked question approach to this. So I'm happy to, to, to request and give you the, 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 the technical helpline. Uh, of the institute's email address is technical at t h e s a i t dot org dot z a. So you can send your questions through. Um, please put the subject line um, regulation uh, of tax practitioners, and then we will make sure it goes into a certain uh, file, and then we will we will because we need to clear that again with the fellow recognized controlling bodies and with SARS. Because what I've said here is our views on it and we have unofficially shared our views with, with SARS um, and with industry and fellow recognized controlling bodies. Um, and we are, we are all on the same page, but there may be uh, slighter deviations uh, in the strict sense. But again, taking into account the spirit of the legislation, what are we after is accountability for tax practitioners and um, for in the public interest and number two to be able to discipline and disbar a person bringing the institute uh, the, the profession in disrepute okay so it, again in your benefit because if let's say those practitioners uh, who are uh, more likely to be non-compliant because they're not affiliated with a professional body before this regulation if they're the troublemakers they're tending our names so we should all, like Mohammed illustrated, embrace the regulation because there's a certain level of professionalism instilled in the system. Again, SARS recognizing us now as recognized, our registered tax practitioners, and us as a recognized controlling body. So again, we would have, uh, we, we, would, we would be able to influence um, the practice of SARS and vice versa, SARS would be able to influence the practice of us as practitioners, all in the benefit of a better and compliant tax practitioner community. Thank you very much.